Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about switching transistor losses and efficiency by looking at an actual circuit. So I prepared the basic asynchronous buck converter and I want to look at how the choice of transistor will impact the overall efficiency and why. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So last time when we looked at the various parameters that have an impact on switching transistor losses, we saw that there are two big categories. On the one side you have conduction loss, loss that is occurring when the transistor is on and conducting current, and then you have various types of losses related to the moment when the transistor switches states, transitioning between conduction and cutoff. So these come under multiple names and partly occur on the switching transistor itself and partly on the transistor driver. To highlight the impact of these two different categories of losses, I will be testing a converter with two different transistors, on the one side the transistor that should have low conduction loss and on the other hand the transistor that should have lower switching losses. So let's start by looking at the tested components, starting with the controller. So I will be using the LM25085 as a controller, so this is a fairly basic p-channel driver and I will mostly be relying on the default application schematic and observing how changing the switching transistor and the current adjustment resistor impacts the overall behavior of the power supply. Now speaking of the transistor, I have two p-channel MOSFETs in DPAC package to test today. So first is the SUD50P06 which under these conditions has a maximum on resistance of 20 milliohms and the SPD09P06 which under the same conditions has a maximum on resistance of 400 milliohms. Now to not keep swapping between the two data sheets, I summarized some of the relevant parameters in the spreadsheet so we can have an easier look at them. So what we can see here is that other than the on resistance where the 9 p 6 is clearly worse, at most of the switching related parameters, the 50 p 6 should have a poor performance, so things like the gate source capacitance is more than 10 times higher, output capacitance is again about 4 to 5 times higher, but interestingly enough, if we look at the rise and fall time values from the datasheet, the sum of these two is almost the same. So even though the second transistor has much smaller capacitances, it shouldn't necessarily be switching faster. So specifically the switching loss should be more or less the same in both of the transistors, capacitance related losses should be much higher with the 50 p 6 and conduction losses should be much higher on the 9 p 6 So the exact behavior with each of these transistors will be quite interesting to see. Other than the technical characteristics, one more interesting parameter to look at is price. So in general, a low RDS on transistor is built using a larger die. So it uses more silicon and it gets its low on resistance by having a larger gate area. So it has larger capacitances. We can clearly see the die difference with our two test components. So the 50P06 has a much larger die than the 09P06. Now the packaging is the same between the two components, but the extra silicon is expensive. So the low on resistance transistor is about two times more expensive than the other one, at least for small volumes. Point being that if you want low conduction losses, you will usually have larger switching related losses and a more expensive transistor. But is it worth it? Now the right way to figure this out is by running the numbers. Specifically for the use case of the buck converter, I highly recommend this application note from ROM Semiconductor that highlights the various types of losses and how to calculate each of them. So by taking this mathematical approach, you can quickly compare different transistors under your specific use case to see how they behave and which would be better. Now after performing the calculations, you can of course also run a circuit simulation. So for today's experiment, I found some models for the two transistors that we're interested in as well as a model for the controller. Now, although the manufacturer does provide a model for the LM25085, I couldn't really get it to work in LTSPICE, but the LM5085 unencrypted transient model did work. So this is the same IC basically, 
it's just that it's the higher voltage version, but otherwise the two are the same. Now, to not run into simulation errors, I had to disconnect this current adjustment capacitor, so since the voltage is fixed from the supply voltage, this shouldn't impact the circuit's behavior. And in the control panel under SPI settings, I had to set the alternate solver. So with these modifications, I stopped running into any sort of issues. Now, to evaluate the performance of the two transistors, I prepared a set of measurement statements. So first of all, I disabled data compression to have as many points as possible for an accurate result. And I set measurement statements to measure the input power, the output power, the efficiency, which is the ratio of these, the total loss, so the difference between the two, and then to have some more specific values, I prepared some measurement statements for the various components. So on the transistor, the gate and the diode. Now, specifically to measure the gate power, I'm calculating this by measuring the current that runs through this R1 and multiplying it by the gate resistance, which is 2.3 ohms from the datasheet, plus this extra 1 ohm, which is placed outside. So this resistor, again, is not really necessary in the real implementation. It's just here for circuit stability. Finally, to evaluate performance over multiple load points, the load resistance isn't a fixed value, but rather a list of parameters. So I go from 100 ohms down to 1 ohm, and then all of these measurement statements are evaluated at each of these points. So finally, if we start running the simulation, it takes quite a while, so this is running quite slowly, and I'm only saving data after 5 milliseconds of simulation, so just to ignore the startup behavior of the circuit, and well, eventually we start getting some data, which can be checked in the error log. So I summarized the various results in this spreadsheet. Now, the efficiency values are quite high, and this is because there is no inductor loss being modeled in the simulator, and the IC current consumption is also not correctly modeled. But other than that, what can we say about these numbers? Well, if we have a look specifically at the efficiency, we can see that both supplies have a peak efficiency at some point. So for the 50P06, it's at around the 1 to 2 ampere point. For the other one, it's at around 100 something milliamps. Up until this point, you have predominantly switching related losses, afterwards it's conduction losses. So that's why we can see that the low on resistance transistor stays fairly efficient at very high loads, whereas the other one doesn't. So the final transistor that you should be using is based on the exact use case. You cannot say that a very low on resistance transistor or a very low capacitance transistor is best. There needs to be a balance between switching and conduction losses at the desired conditions for best results. Another interesting aspect of the simulation is that at the one ampere point, it predicts very similar results. So regardless of transistor, if your intention is to have a one ampere load, it doesn't really matter which you're using but this will be something to check out in the real life implementation. So simulation is done. Next step is to check the real life behavior. After all, the exact IC behavior is not modeled that well, and we could see some differences in the practical circuit. In general, though calculations and simulations are important, they are not usually enough. So to do this, I prepared the circuit based on the datasheet typical implementation, some of the component values are slightly changed, and I will be swapping the current adjustment resistor, so this R5, based on which transistor is being used. Since this resistor impacts the current threshold, and the current measurement is done by seeing the voltage drop on the transistor. Now, from a layout point of view, nothing really special. The entire circuit is built on a single layer, so all of the components fitted in, and the second layer is just used as a ground plane. So the power stage, so the input capacitor, the switching transistor, diode, inductor, and output capacitor are placed in a separate region from the IC, so to prevent any noise from interfering with the IC's operation, and both input and output terminals are placed on one side of the board. With everything assembled, this is how the complete board looks like. So between tests, I will be keeping the same board and components, just swapping out the transistor and the current adjusting resistor. This way, there shouldn't be any differences coming from component tolerances. To verify the circuit, I prepared this test setup with the board supplied from 12 volts, and the output is set to 5 volts, 
and I connected an active load to the output to be able to set various output loads. And to measure the exact current passing through the circuit, I have an amp meter on the input and an amp meter on the output. So right now it's set to output 1 amp at 5 volts. So first thing to check is the switching behavior of the circuit. So for that I prepared the oscilloscope and first thing that we can look at is the voltage in the gate of the transistor. So if I just make a single capture, we can see that the gate voltage oscillates between the supply voltage and well, another threshold. So since this is a P-channel MOSFET, it goes between the supply and some other voltage. And this voltage is not really ground, it's some other voltage set by the internal regulator. So this variation is about 7.7 .7 volts. Now the exact transitions between the high and low states, we can see that they are extremely sharp. So the meter is measuring 2 nanoseconds both on the rising and on the falling edge. We do see a bit of ringing, but the driver seems to have no issue driving this particular transistor. So with the first transistor, the 09P06, we have no problems with the gate driving. If we now look on the switching node, so the output of the transistor, make another single capture, well we see a completely different story. So we are transitioning between zero and supply voltage, but the transition times are quite slow. So 65 nanoseconds of rise time, 21 nanoseconds of fall time. So even though the gate is being driven really, really quickly, because of the way in which the transistor is built, the switching times are rather slow. Now if we move to the other transistor, so I saw the transistor and the adjustment resistor and I set the same load. If we start looking at the various waveforms again, so starting off with the signal in the gate, we can already see that it's a completely different story. So since this transistor has far higher gate capacitance, we can see that the transition from high to low and low to high isn't that clean as before, there's quite a lot of oscillation both on the falling and rising edge, and the oscilloscope is showing us completely different timings. So we have a 35 nanosecond fall time and a 50 nanosecond rise time. If we also look at the switching node now, here we can see again a different story. So we have quite a lot of ringing occurring at both transitions, but the transitions are quite fast, so 31 nanoseconds fall time, 6 nanoseconds rise time. So even though the gate driver has quite a lot of difficulties in driving this transistor, the transistor itself is switching quite fast. Speaking of the driver, another way in which we can look at the transistor is by taking a thermal image of it. So even without preparing the board, so coating with some sort of paint to have a uniform emissivity, we can still get some sort of idea of how the board is working. So if I take a thermal image of the board, so with the 1 ampere load, and we have a look at this image, so with the 09P06 transistor driving the 1 ampere load, we see the typical heat sources. The diode, the switching transistor, and the inductor. And everything else on the board is more or less heated up by these three components from the power stage. So this is the typical behavior that you would be expecting with a switching converter. If we now swap the transistor and have a look at the thermal behavior again, we can see a somewhat different story. So the power dissipated on the diode and the inductor are the same as before, those are more or less load dependent, however the power consumed by the board is more or less the same, but the power dissipated on the transistor is much smaller this time. So with the lower on-resistance transistor, we have smaller conduction losses, hence the smaller temperature on it. Now the global power dissipation is more or less the same. So all the power that used to be on the transistor has now moved on to the driver IC. And this is not really a situation that you want to find yourself in. So the power transistor is designed for power dissipation. You can put it on an appropriate heatsink and you can dissipate quite a lot of power with it. The driver IC on the other hand isn't really designed for this. So you want to make sure when designing a power supply and choosing components that you don't overload the IC and you don't end up making the driver the hottest component of the board. Finally, we can have a look at the efficiency of the converter. So which transistor is generating an overall better efficiency? For that, I will be using also a voltmeter to measure the voltage on the supply, so on the terminals, 
and I will be varying the load to make this measurement at multiple voltages. So starting with the 1 ampere load, we see 5.03 volts on the output and 12.03 on the input. So after changing components, we can again run the same efficiency measurements and with this other transistor, we get these other values. So what we can see is that both transistors have similar efficiency levels at the 1 ampere point. At higher currents, the 50p09 is more efficient because of its lower on resistance, whereas at low currents, the other transistor, the 09p06, is better because of the various lower capacitances. So even though these results are not exactly the same as in the simulation, they are quite close. In the end, for this particular power supply, neither transistor is the best. You could probably get better results with a transistor that has more than 20 milliohms of on resistance, but with capacitances and switching speeds higher than the 09P06. Anyway, the point I was trying to make is that each use case is different, and the ideal components to be used need to be decided based on a multitude of factors. The ideal transistor for one use case is not the same as another use case. But in general, you want to focus on low on resistance for high current power supplies and low capacitances and low switching losses in high frequency and low current supplies. Another thing to keep in mind is that just because power in a switching converter passes through the power stage, the transistor driver should not be ignored. As we saw with this particular implementation, a transistor with very high capacitances can put extra strain on the controller IC, which might lead to all sorts of other issues. So the power supply needs to be analyzed as a whole. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave it us in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated to all my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.